thank you for the introduction and welcome to my workshop. So let me first ask you, uh, or first I would like to explain the purpose of this uh, workshop. It was written that it is for beginners and uh, by that I meant it's for beginners in Rust. Although I expect you to no have some knowledge of programming and memory management and so on. So I'm sorry if you're new in programming uh, completely. And uh, so right now, uh, do you have uh, any knowledge of Rust? Or who of you know Rust at, at least a bit? Okay. Okay, that's like half of the people. So I will quickly introduce uh, Rust, the language itself, and then we will try some examples. Okay, so mirror. And so really a quick introduction into the Rust programming language. So, first of all, the pretty <laughs> obvious question is why just another language? And since we don't have much time, I will quickly uh, describe what is Rust about and why you w would like to use it. So, I think there is no single language to rule all the applications from uh, IoT to web applications and scientific uh, com computations, but uh, I think Rust is uh, appropriate language for many, many domains. So uh, I think it started as a replacement for C++, so if you're familiar with C++, the syntax is pretty, uh, pretty similar, although it has some uh, features that are usually found in functional languages, like, uh, for example, if expression returns a value, so as opposed to C, you don't need any ternary operators or similar, similar constructions because everything returns a value. And also we have pattern matching, which is uh, also mm, more uh, popular in functional languages. Uh, probably the most uh, significant feature of Rust is its memory management. There is no garbage collector, although it is not as manual in, as in C. So uh, you don't have to allocate memory by hand and deallocate by hand. Uh, although there are some rules you need to obey to acquire the memory and then release the memory. And these are called ownership and it means that every value has some unique owner and the unique owner can borrow the values and it, it is responsible for freeing the of them. But uh, this, as opposed to C and C++, is uh, checked during the compilation time. So you will get a memory safety, uh, let's say, for free. <laughs> okay, the type system is a little bit different uh, than in mainstream languages. Uh, it has static typing with type inference. That means you don't have to write the types, but there are types known at uh, the compilation time. So uh, even though you don't write them, there must be a known type. And uh, you can get errors uh, from the compiler that you need to specify which type it should use if it's not uh, clear from the context. And uh, yeah, of course, uh, there is support for generic prog programming but it does not support object-oriented programming as we know it from Java, for example. If you want to uh, get polymorphism, you need to use traits, which is something similar to type classes from Haskell, if you know. Okay, so using all these uh, features, uh, Rust uh, is able to guarantee uh, memory safety, so you, if you use only safe Rust, uh, 
you should get no double freeze, no use after freeze, or out of bound access, which are pretty common uh, memory related uh, errors when you're writing in C. And using the type system, it also guarantee no data races in multi-threaded code, which is pretty nice. They, the marketing uh, expression is fearless concurrency. And this is actually really nice because usually when we are writing uh, multi-threaded code, it's hard to debug when it's broken. So using uh, Rust uh, static analysis, it's, uh, I would say, much more pleasant to, to write. And uh, also using the, let's say, a little bit more uh, complicated type system of Rust, you can write libraries that are hard to misuse. So for example, when I was writing some code using OpenSSL, I was pretty scared that I, I got the API wrong because I couldn't understand the documentation. And there is just a void pointer to everything. So <laughs> it's, it's uh, really, really easy to misuse. And in Rust, uh, we use the complicated type system to only allow uh, the, some specific usage of the API so that you cannot misuse it. OK, so what is the language good for? So it started as a language for writing uh, a browser. But it's, of course, not uh, usable only for uh, this purpose. Uh, you will get uh, the presentation afterwards, I guess, right? You, you should yeah. take it from me, right. So I include some links to interesting blog posts, which I found online. For example, uh, many people use Rust for speeding up their web services. So for example, uh, I read some articles about uh, log parsing. There was a Ruby service. And uh, after they had more and more uh, customers, they found out there is a bottleneck in parsing. So they, they wrote this uh, part in Rust, and it was uh, much faster. You can also write some network services, even operating systems. Also, pretty interesting domain is WebAssembly, although I don't really know <laughs> anything about it. And uh, uh, finally, IoT. If there is a backend, compiler backend for your platform, it should be possible to compile to embedded devices as well. OK, and <laughs> final advice. If you're just starting with Rust, uh, don't give up. It tends to be difficult. Uh, in the beginning, uh, sometimes they call uh, learning Rust fighting with borrow checker. I call it discussing with borrow checker <laughs> because I think it's uh, more positive. <laughs> uh, OK, so these are the sources, and you will get them afterwards. OK, so I hope you have laptops. OK, perfect. And I hope the internet connection will be available for all of you, although I cannot guarantee anything. Do you have any questions right now? No. So uh, we can start by opening the main page of Rust language and the install tab. So this is the recommended installation method on Linux. If you find it scary, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, alternative uh, is using package manager. If, for example, if you have Fedora, there is the latest stable version of uh, Rust, and you can it install it using uh, to do, 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 install Rust and Cargo. Is it right, Igor? 
but I should have it already. Uh, oh yeah, that's DNS extension. Use it. It's awesome. Uh, one point thirty-two, preferably. If you have RHEL, then you probably have some older version. Okay, old Fedora is poor choice. <laughs> uh, okay, do you have a Rust compiler and cargo? Slide? Yeah, sure. Or. Uh, it's, uh, well, if you download Rust compiler using uh, DNF, for example, you will get the compiler and the package manager. But as far as I know, if you want to use, for example, VS Code and the new Rust language server, it won't work because it uses uh, Rust app to download all the components. So, yeah. It's a shame, but what can I do? So the version should be 1.2? 1.32. 1 1.16. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's old. quite old. And OK, uh, next uh, thing which is new in uh, the 2018 edition is uh, official Rust language server. It's possible to use it with uh, VS Code or probably Atom and, of course, Vim and Emacs. Uh, the official uh, solution is VS Code because they don't have capacity to support all editors. So I have just the official VS Code extension. And if you used Rust app to get uh, the compiler and the package manager, it should be pretty easy to install uh, IDE integration as well. Just open extensions in uh, VS Code, type Rust, and this extension should uh, automatically download Rust language server and the source code for necessary for the code analysis, etc. Do you have any troubles? ask if you have any issues. So, uh, yeah, of course, uh, alternatively, you can also use IntelliJ, which has also pretty nice uh, plugin. It's not based on the official Rust language server, but it's their own, and I think it's uh, really, really good. Okay, so let's uh, try some uh, projects. If you want to start a new project in Rust, you can use the package manager Cargo and just create a new, let's say, first command line app. Hit enter and that's it. It used to default to library because uh, each uh, Rust project has its uh, associated type. It's either library or binary. It used to default into library. Now it defaults to binary. So you don't have to type binary anymore. OK. Now let's write hello world. And it's done. <laughs> Sorry, it's <laughs> it's written by default. <laughs> okay. Do you all have hello world? 
getting there. <laughs> Downloading. Yeah. That's unfortunate. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, if you want to run the the project, just type cargo run, and it will compile the project in debug mode and run it. As simple as that. Okay, so uh, as you can see, the main function doesn't have any return value, and uh, that's because return. Uh, integer return values are specific for some platforms. So they use this, uh, let's say, void uh, return type for main. And if you want to specify a return uh, value, you just need to use exit explicitly. But uh, in uh, the new version of Rust, you can actually use uh, a result type, which is some okay, uh, something new. That uh, wasn't available in the previous edition, if you tried. And uh, that's because in Rust, we don't have exceptions. So there are no throw keywords, no catch keywords. And we only use uh, these uh, result types. A result type is a type that contains either a successful value or an error. And if you want to get the value, you need to unwrap the result explicitly. So you can use it instead of uh, the uh, exceptions, but uh, we need some, uh, yeah. It used to be more verbose than uh, using exceptions because, as you know, when you are using exceptions, you just throw in some inner function and then uh, 10 functions away, you just catch it. So it's pretty convenient. In uh, Rust, you cannot do this, but we have uh, a new question mark operator. So. Let me, um, for example, write some uh, application that will parse uh, command line arguments. That's pretty common, right? So we can include standard library environment module, and we will create a a variable and we will load the command line arguments using args function that is available in the uh, in the library now as you can see there is uh, no type but as I said uh, there is a type known but we just don't have to write it so let's try to compile the code. And yeah, of course, it doesn't work because uh, yeah, now it works. So. Uh, I also need to uh, include the error uh, trait because that's the return type we will use when we start uh, doing some operations that can fail. And uh, since we are returning result from the function, we cannot uh, return anything. We need to return uh, either a success or an error. So 
at the end of the function, I just return empty success. That's the Sauron I. <laughs> okay, perfect. Now, uh, there is a nice, uh, nice way to uh, explore variable types. When you don't know what type the variable is, you can write something ridiculous like this and then ask the compiler, hey, what's the type? <laughs> and it will tell you <laughs> because he's nice. So it's some arcs type. And uh, now we should open the standard library documentation. So let's just open Google, set to the Rust link. And this is the official documentation. I recommend you to open it. You will find really, really useful information there. So we can see what the arcs type is. And it says that it is an iterator over arguments yielding a string for each argument. So now we can go back and let's explore what's inside of uh, the arguments uh, variable. Uh, or A really nice uh, feature of Rust is that you can use the for loop for any type that implements iterator trait. And that's the polymorphism I was talking about. So if uh, your variable implements iterator, you can, you can use for loop to iterate over, over it. And uh, as the documentation said, it will yield a string for each argument. So those uh, A values will be string. And if you have the newest compiler, the 1.32, you can use this uh, convenient debug macro. That's the latest, greatest <laughs> addition. OK. Yeah, of course. I need to download this nonsense, uh, delete this nonsense. Okay, right now there is only uh, there is only the name of the executable, so that's the only command line argument. But we can use uh, cargo to actually provide some command line, ar command line arguments. For example, like this, you will use the dash dash syntax, then space, and some, something that will be uh, provided as a command line argument to the binary. So use the dash dash space syntax. Okay, and now we can see there is a new uh, command line argument, c equals 5. Okay. Now, if we want to parse some uh, arguments, we can... Uh, yeah. <coughs> uh, 
we can, for example, check if the uh, command line arguments start with some prefix. So, for example, when I, when I want to write a, a, an application that uh, takes uh, dash c as uh, an argument, I can use just if the argument starts with dash c. And that's it. And let's just do nothing right now and try to compile. It works. Nice. <laughs> okay, so now we know that the argument starts with dash c and we w want to split the string with the equal sign and then take whatever is on the right side and parse it. So we can use uh, we can use a split and equal sign. Yeah, if you are coming from Python, there is a difference between single and double colon. Uh, no quotes. <laughs> so just be careful. And then we need to, this uh, split function does not uh, return an array. It returns some special split type. And if we want to make it an array, we need to collect the result. This is pretty common in uh, the standard library API because some, uh, some structures are lazy, meaning that the result won't be evaluated unless you explicitly ask for it. So we can use collect to collect the result. And of course we need to uh, give it some name. Now, what is, uh, this is not going to work. I will show you the error. And it says that the compiler cannot infer type for this variable. And that's because the collect function is pretty smart and you can actually choose what uh, return type you want. So you have to explicitly state something. Okay, now uh, you have, uh, right now you have two options. Either you will use uh, the syntax for regular uh, types, meaning that you will write a colon after the name and then the type, or there is a special syntax in Rust it's called a turbo fish, which is much more funny. <laughs> and we write it like this, the, the turbo fish. And now into the turbo fish, you need to <coughs> write what you want. So I say that I want a vector of something. Again, this is special syntax. You can sometimes use it. If you need to specify only some parts of uh, the type, but not the whole, whole type. You can use uh, the underscore and you say basically, okay, uh, infer this part of the type for me. So you don't have to specify the whole type. And let's see if this still works. Okay, it still works. So no problem. Now, Finally, we can, uh, okay, we can uh, read the number that's uh, behind the equal sign. So let's parse the number and we'll say that it parts uh, the first, we are counting, counting from zero and then parse. 
so right now we say take uh, the first or well in human terms the second the second argument and uh, and then parse it again the parse function is generic over its return type so you can choose what you want so let's again use the or we will use the command syntax and let's try to build it okay it, this doesn't work because of course parsing can fail right and as i said uh, rust api should be hard to misuse so you cannot just uh, return result of parsing uh, function into 32-bit uh, unsigned integer because that's uh, not uh, well that's not just not correct because it can fail right so you have to handle the result somehow yeah you can see the type here now usually uh, in examples you will see something like unwrap or in a lot of examples, you will see something like unwrap, but uh, that's uh, just a convenient way to write uh, code examples on GitHub and Stack Overflow, so please don't copy it <laughs> into your production code, because this will take the result, and if the result is an error, it will panic uh, the thread and just uh, stop it. So don't just blindly copy paste please <laughs> and instead we will use finally the question mark okay do you have the code Do you need any help? No. Yes, that's uh, what I will explain right now. Let me just uh, run the code. Oh, yeah, we can do something with, let's say, print line. Yes, and also what I haven't mentioned yet is that this uh, exclamation mark means that this is a macro it's not a function call in uh, rust we don't have variadic functions so if you want to write uh, some uh, something that takes uh, variable var variable number of arguments you need to use macro because you don't have variadic functions as opposed to c and let's just print the number so this is the this is the syntax for print macro <coughs> you write the this <laughs> and then you say what uh, variable you want to print and again this uh, this variable needs to implement some trait and it needs to implement a display trait meaning that this value can somehow be turned into string basically but uh, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, types in uh, the standard library implements it already so in the beginning you shouldn't hit problems with this Yes, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> As I said, it tends to be a little bit uh, difficult to get started with. That's uh, pretty common. Uh, like uh, pre pretty common when I'm trying to teach someone Rust, he says, or he or she says that uh, it's uh, difficult because you need to understand a lot of concepts because you can 
before you can even write some hello world, uh, I don't know, network application. Now, this is, okay, I will put it on top. This is what the question mark does. I provided a letter instead of a number, right? So that's an error. And the parse function failed. Now, the question mark operator works in a way that if the return value is an error, it will immediately return from the function here. And if the result is success, it will just unwrap the successful value and assign it to the variable. So that's basically like saying, if this failed, just forward the failure to the, up, to the next function. And if it didn't fail, just use the value and continue. So this is uh, like a convenient method for forwarding the failures in your code. So this is what we use instead of, uh, on s instead of exceptions. And this code can fail also in at least one another way. <laughs> can you spot the place? Uh, um, okay, here. Exactly. Or you miss, or you yes or you just don't write equal sign, for example, like this. And now it will fail. But, it, excuse me. <laughs> it says that the thread main panicked at index out of bounds. So I said that uh, you won't get any uh, out of bounds errors, but uh, I should uh, probably say that you won't get any undefined behavior as a, as a consequence of out of bound access. So this is uh, what uh, Rust will do if, uh, you, if you try to access uh, an array out of bound, it will panic, panic the thread. Right now we have only one thread, so the whole process fails and that's it. If we had uh, multi-threaded <coughs> code, uh, we could just catch the panic, write some uh, node to the user and just uh, spin up new, new thread. But uh, this is also, I think, new addition in the, in the 2018 edition. Okay, so it says uh, run with uh, Rust backtrace for a backtrace, this is pretty nice for debugging. We can try it, and I'm using fish, so I will use it, do it like this. And it's pretty, it's pretty huge, the backtrace. This is unfortunate, but there is <coughs> nothing you can do about it, but <laughs> probably <laughs> uh, somewhere in the middle, you can find the place in main function that failed. So it says that it failed on the main.rs uh, file line 12. So let's just open it. And of course, this is the line where we are trying to access the array and we are not checking if it, the array is long enough. But uh, fortunately, fortunately, okay, uh, we can use instead of this uh, instead of this syntax, we can use a method that is uh, safe and it will return 
a result or optional, yeah, it will return optional value from, from the vector. So the parts variable is of type vector. So let's see the standard documentation for vector. Again, open the standard library documentation. And here on the left side, you can see a lot of, a lot of methods that are available for this uh, structure. Uh, I must say it's so lo long that sometimes it's ha hard to uh, find what you really want, but be sure that <coughs> if you're ser looking for something, it's probably there. And I'm looking for at mm. that <coughs> okay so it's not add it's get and uh, the get function okay get function returns an optional type. You can see the option over there. It's similar to uh, the result, but in the result type we saw that uh, you can either return a successful value or an error. If you don't have any error to specify, but still the computation can fail, you can use optional uh, value. It has only the successful value, but still you need to explicitly unwrap, unwrap the, the value. For example, this, uh, this method is obvious. If it <coughs> fails, there was no, uh, there was no, uh, there was no value at uh, number one, at index number one. So let's try it. And we will write get one and question mark again. And this probably won't. Yes. Now, uh, I said that uh, the question mark will return immediately from the function if there was an error. It works also for option, but right now we specified that the return type is heap allocated error. So right now we cannot return just none and we need to turn it into error type. So we will go to the documentation for option. Uh, is some. No. And Okay, I think I got lost in this example. Excuse me? Okay. Yes, thank you. So 
So this is the documentation for OK or function here. And uh, what you can see is that it transformed the option into result. So that's what we want, right? Because we want to return a result if uh, it, it failed. So, OK. We will just use OK or and do 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 do. let's just try to use zero and see. No. We need to. Okay, we probably should use some better error, some out of bound excess, but since I don't have time, let's just return some some error. And let's see if you can use parse error. Uh, okay, sorry, I probably got lost in this one. <laughs> no, right, right now we are not discussing with the borrow checker. We are discussing with the type system. And uh, yeah, uh, I forgot uh, the the error type I wanted to use here. <laughs> so, but uh, we are uh, running out of time. Do you have any questions? Uh, let's get back to the original implementation. Do you have any questions uh, so far? I have one question. Yes. You create a new language and you try to get rid of, for example, C++. You create a new language to replace C++. And why do you make it so difficult to learn as much as C++. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is uh, this is good question. I think you are looking for Go. <laughs> yes, I, I, I have a presentation about Go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. it makes sense. If, if, for example, if you try to migrate for, from C to Go, Go is a very easy language because it's very simple. It doesn't yes. have all of these uh, yes. Uh, you can find in other languages. You, you, if you, for example, if you are familiar with Java and you, you learn Go, you see. What can I do with this language? There, there are a lot of things that I have in Java that it does not have in Go. Yes. Uh, okay. <coughs> of course, this is a good question, and I think if you want a language that is easy to learn you're good with Go, but uh, this language was supposed to be uh, really safe. And if you want to guarantee safety at the compilation time, you need to make it uh, this uh, complicated. Because, for example, C is pretty easy to learn, right? You just write malloc and it will give you heap allocated uh, memory space, fine. It's pretty easy, but it's al also very error prone. And but uh, you cannot use it in uh, for everything. No. I I would say that uh, it's uh, you. You still have the runtime, Go runtime, and you cannot use it, for example, for embedded devices or writing bare operating systems. Mm -hmm. So uh, yes, that's uh, what people actually ask quite often. If it's a good idea to compare Go and Rust. 
I think uh, Go has different goals. The goal of Go was to make a simple language that can be used as a, let's say, again, a replacement for a C, but in a different domain. Uh, Go so is, is more for networking and yeah. multiprocessing. I'm sorry, we are, we are out of time. But feel free to reach to me and ask more questions. <laughs>